Welcome to the official Jets podcast. Eric Allen here as always at one Jets drive. I shouldn't say as always because I was in Florida last week at the annual league meetings (laughs) and I am joined by my guy, Leger Duzable, who is pretty much permanently in Florida now. Deuce, how are you doing today? I'm good, EA. So you got a little bit of tan. You was down in Orlando, you know, kicking it down there oh. with the owners, you know, getting those yeah, those I, those much needed interviews. <laughs> hey, hey man, let me tell you something. The weather here is atrocious. <laughs> Okay, so I was very fortunate to go there and work for a few days. I I, I can't blame (laughs) you. I've heard up there in New York and Jersey, it's been literally raining cats and dogs, they said, for the last few days. Yeah, man. So this is our draft podcast. We're focusing on the Jets in the 2024 draft. With that being said, there are a lot of things that continue to happen this offseason that is going to impact the New York Jets Come April 25th through April 27th in the Motor City of Detroit. Um, Your thoughts on Joe Douglas making a trade with the Philadelphia Eagles and acquiring Hassan Reddick? Where do I begin, EA? I I mean, (laughs) to get a guy of the quality of Hassan Reddick this late into free agency, and even though it was via trade, I mean, home run for Joe Douglas and his staff. Now, there was question marks about a potential Jadavion Clowney signing. There was Shaq Barrett out there, and the Jets end up missing out on both of those guys. But it seemed like the Jets were doing their due diligence and homework on Hassan Reddick, and they felt like that was an option. And again, kudos to Joe D for getting this done with Howie Roseman, the GM for the Philadelphia Eagles. You lose. Bryce Huff, who was your best edge rusher last year, 10 and a half sacks, led this team. I think this was an under-the-radar big need for the Jets. Like, people weren't talking about this enough because when you look at the Jets, you always account for them having a championship-type defense, right, EA? So when you look at the roster, you see Will McDonald went in the first round last year. You think he takes a big step in the second year. You have Jermaine Johnson, who was a pro bowler last year. You still have JFM, and you have Michael Clemens, right? So you look at the roster, you're like – all right, it's a need, but I don't know if it's a major need, but it is a major need when you look at Robert Sala and how he wants this team to play and how he wants to have a number of pass rushers just affecting the quarterback. And boy, did they feel that need, EA, when you talk about Hassan Reddick. Besides, it's him and Miles Garrett are one of the two players in the NFL in the last four years that have had double-digit sacks in four consecutive years. You talk about consistency. You talk about being a closer and a finisher. You lost one of your closers and finishers in Bryce Huff, and boy, did you answer the bell in getting another one, and one of the best in the league, not just closing and finishing, but getting the ball off the quarterback, EA. I mean, I I remember vividly going to Instagram and Twitter with a live video. I think I had just finished work. I had my shirt off and said, rejoice, Jet Nation, rejoice. (laughs) Joe D does it again. He gets one of the best finishers this late into free agency. Again, home run Robert Sala and Joe Douglas getting Hassan Reddick on board. So let's give Bryce Huff a lot of credit. Let's get this coaching staff a lot of credit in terms of development. That's one thing that you always preach because – This guy went from undrafted free agent out of Memphis to transforming his body to becoming an elite pass rusher. With that being said, this is no knock on Bryce Huff. And he cashed in. I know you're happy about that as a former player for guys to take that route. An undrafted guy, yeah. (laughs) Yes, yes. So, But have the Jets upgraded at the position considering you bring in a guy like Reddick who – you just said 15 and a half sacks the last four seasons. That's fourth in the National Football Correct. League. All, also, 15 forced fumbles over that time, 13 strip sacks over the course of that time as well. Both those numbers lead the NFL. So when you look at the defensive end position, haven't you upgraded as a whole? This is no slight to Bryce Huff, like you stated before asking this question. Bryce Huff is a hell of a player. You know my affinity for Bryce Huff. Going back to the 21 season before people didn't even know who he was, just watching film and and knowing what he could be and what he's developed into, this is an upgrade for the New York Jets. And I I say that because when you look at what Hassan Reddick has done, the consistency and what he's done with, and then you have to 
preface that by saying Bryce Huff hasn't had as many opportunities as Bryce Huff yep. as well. But the consistency that Hassan Reddick has been able to do this, knowing that teams know know that he's the closer, and a lot of times he is getting chipped and still being able to get to the quarterback and affect him, and how well he has been able to play the run game as a slam Sam linebacker or as an edge guy, being able to slip blocks and get tackles for loss. This is a this is an upgrade because you're getting a guy that you know and you've seen on film for four consecutive years be dominant, right? With Bryce Huff, it's more of a projection of what he could be when he gets starter reps. Uh, now, there's a two-year age gap, which isn't massive in the NFL, but this is an upgrade for the Jets. You're getting a Pro Bowl slash all-pro caliber type player to pair with a guy who just went to his first Pro Bowl in Jermaine Johnson. And I say to this too, EA, yes, Joe Douglas is happy. Yes, Robert Sala is happy. But you know who is the happiest? Quinnen Williams. Right. Because yeah, now it's going to be extremely hard to double team him playing and play out. Now, if I'm teams, I'm still stopping Q because everybody knows that interior pressure gets there faster than the outside pressure. So I'm still going to double him. But the thing is, you have to think about if you're going to double him now with Jermaine Johnson on one side and also Quentin Williams on the other. And now you got JFM rushing on the inside. Man, I, when Robert Sala envisioned his defense, this is what he envisioned. This is the type of D line he wants. And I love Hassan Reddick when he had his first press conference with the Jets. He says, people don't even know what's about to hit him. And I cannot wait to yeah. see this defensive line feast. Uh, one of the fans tweeted the other day in my notifications, that was one of the most impressive introductory news conferences yeah. that he had seen from a Jet. I mean, Hassan Reddick, he knocked it out of the park. He did. Not only is he an outstanding football player, man, he is going to be an awesome culture fit, yeah. and he brings that postseason experience to this group as well. And not only that, I think people tend to forget former walk-on at Temple, right, had to get it the yep. hard way, uh, and everybody knows what's synonymous with Temple, Temple tough, right? That's the, his mantra, his attitude, and when he got drafted to the Arizona Cardinals, they kind of misused the skill set. They didn't know if he yeah. was going to be an off-the-ball linebacker and an edge guy, and it took him a little while to get going. Well, he balled out, and even after that, EA still had to sign a prove it deal in Carolina before actually getting paid, and then he went to Carolina, double-digit sacks. Then went to Philadelphia, two years in a row, double-digit sacks. So he's used to being that guy, even though he went high in the first round, that people have doubted. And even now, he probably feels some disrespect because Philadelphia didn't want to give him an extension. So you're coming – you got yeah. a guy, kind of like how Aaron Rodgers was last year, that's going to come in with a little piss and vinegar because people are doubting who he is and what he can still do at this level, even though he's 29 years old. So – like, to your point and what the fans said in your inbox, that was one of the most impressive press conference introductory speeches I've seen. And I just love the attitude and mentality that he's going to bring to this locker room. Yeah, and he does not worry in the least bit about his contract situation where he's up at the end of this year where he basically said, listen, that all is going to take care of itself. He yep. said... I'm excited for a new chapter, a new beginning. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, Ian. So I want, I want, I want to just, I just wanted to get your thoughts real quickly on, as far as what we've seen here in free agency, and again, this is all connected to the draft. Is a lot of one-year deals or guys <laughs> who are going to expire at the end of the 2024 season. Reddick is included in that bunch, specifically with him. How do you envision this? working out short-term and possibly long-term. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the Jets sold him on. You can play with Aaron Rodgers, have an opportunity to hit the free agent market, kind of like they did with Mike Williams, right? You come in, okay. ball out, hit the free agent market, because we kind of talked about this off-camera, EA, like with the draft coming up and certain places on the team and rosters, like there has to be some pieces that are going to be there for the next three or four years. You stated it perfectly. There are so many deals signed in free agency via the Jets that were all like one year deals, right? So you're going to be in the same scenario next year and the Jets are in a all in situation, but you still need to have longevity for this team and consistency on this team by drafting players that can develop after these players that have one year deals move on, potentially move on, kind of like we saw Bryce Huff leave. They bring in Reddick. They signed, you know, drafted Will McDonald. Those are the guys that have to be the front 
and foundational pieces for this roster going forward. The the Quentin Williams, the Sauce Gardners, the Jermaine Johnsons, the AVTs. Like that's what you know. It's always funny when you get into great spirited debates with people on Twitter. And you know, I believe earlier this offseason we were talking about this in the third round. EA, I said the Jets got to draft the D tackle, and people came at my neck. EA and I was like, when you realize <laughs> yeah, this was before free agency, I was like, you realize. Quentin Williams is the only D tackle under contract, right? And now when you still look at it after next year, Quentin Williams will still be the only D tackle under contract. So eventually you have to build foundational pieces that can grow together or developmental pieces that can grow together and not just live in the realm of one year deals. Now it's worked for the Jets at the D tackle position. It seems like every D tackle that comes here has a career year and they'll <laughs> then goes yeah. gets paid somewhere else. So uh they've been I've been lucky and a little blessed when it comes to that scenario, but you got to be able to build through the draft and have foundational pieces and build for the longevity of the franchise. Position groups, Deuce, heading into Detroit, where are the most pressing needs right now? Immediate needs. I say there's probably three that I look at, right? To to me, it's the receiver position, uh, O-line, and then I would say the safety position. And I think the safety position yep. is one of the most pressing needs, if not the most, when you look at what currently is on the roster. I love the signing of Chuck Clark was going to be a starter last year, ends up going down in, in training camp with an injury. Unfortunately, they were able to bring him back. One, I think there's a missing piece of this. Ashton Davis has yet to sign, I believe, right? Right. Uh, it'll be interesting yes. as time goes on and the safety market kind of materializes as it is right now because Justin Simmons is another big name. Quandry Diggs, another big name that is still out there. Uh, I know Joe D has done a really good job of letting the market kind of come to the Jets in regards to signing players. He did that with Tyron Smith, did it with Mike Williams, waited and was able to – pull off a great trade with Hassan Reddick. I think he's doing the same thing at the safety position. And people have been up and down on the safety class. I think it's a middle-of-the-pack safety class. I think there's some really good players. Cole Bishop is a guy that I've marked to the Jets in the third round, a guy that can play in the box right away. We know Tony Adams is a guy that can play middle field safety. But Bishop also gives you the the ability to cover tight ends one-on-one. He's a really good blitzer. And if you need him to, he can play middle of the field safety as well. So I like Cole Bishop a lot, potentially in the third round, um, depending on what the Jets do going forward. Does Ashton Davis come on? Do they sign another guy like a Quandre Diggs or Justin Simmons, just depending on what the cap looks like going for us forward. So uh, I think safety is big. Also, we talked about development, right? And the offensive tackle, I think is a need. I don't think it's as big a need as everybody says it is, right? Because when you look at this, when you draft somebody in the third, fourth, fifth round EA, these are guys that have to eventually be spot starters for you or develop into starters, right? Took Max Mitchell and Carter Warren in the fourth round. Like they have to be part of this scenario if you want longevity. And people will say, well, we saw Max Mitchell and he really struggled. But you got to understand the situation he was thrown into too, right? He wasn't supposed to play his rookie year. Carter Warren wasn't supposed to play his rookie year. Like those are the guys that you're hoping – are like your fourth tackle their first year, right? Like last year, Max Mitchell yeah. should have been the third tackle, right, in his second year. This year, Carter Warren should be the third tackle as a swing guy. Mm-hmm. And you hope they continue to develop where if you need them, right, they can come in a spot start. And if they play well enough, potentially turn into starters. So I love that Joe D has kind of addressed the depth when it comes to the offensive line, Jake has, uh, Hansen, and then you also look at Wes Schweister, guys who have been spot starters yeah. as well. I think you need one more piece. I'm not as high as everybody else in taking somebody at number 10. I think you still need a playmaker because even though you sign Mike Williams, he's on a one-year deal. And I know people will say the same thing can be said for the offensive tackles. Both of our tackles are on one-year deals. But at least you have two viable guys behind them that you took in the fourth round in back-to-back drafts. Red receiver, you don't have that. All right, we got a lot of things to get to, but you just mentioned Williams, and before we start talking about Joe Douglas's draft history here, there's a plug. <laughs> Williams, prototypical X, coming off the ACL that he sustained in week three last year. The Jets have the benefit of having that experience with Brees Hall. Now, Brees Hall might be a super f- superhuman, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've not, never, se- never seen anything like that. He seems like he, he might have different blood in his system than everybody else. I don't know. He's just just an incredible achievement, what he did last year. Correct. But, Mike, you know, Mike Williams is going to be on a program. The Jets are going to try to 
have him raring to go by the time week one hits. But he's that prototypical, uh, prototypical big X receiver who's averaged more than 15 yards per catch throughout his career, 31 touchdowns. When you say receiver in the draft, are you specifically thinking X? Yeah. I'm specific- or not necessarily? I mean – Yep. It's so it's when you when you say that question or ask, are you thinking about a specific like X? Because some people may consider Garrett Wilson an X, but he can move around, right? And I think right. depending on yeah. your skill set, like that's why I have Mark Broma Dunze to the Jets because he can be moved around. He played in the slot, he played on the outside, and Mike Williams is on a one year deal. Could he potentially, when Mike Williams leaves in free agency, because that was the selling point to him, come play with Aaron Rodgers, show that you're healthy, then you can hit the free agent market again. Um, you take Roman Dunze, then you have somebody already ready to take over that spot when he leaves. And that's what I talked about, EA, teams that have success, right? They develop guys, they develop guys really well. And then one guy leaves, not only do they get a compensatory pick back for him, they have another guy ready to step up and play in his stead. Like the Pittsburgh Steelers have done it for years. The Ravens have done it for years. The, the Green Bay Packers are another team that has done it that way for years. So uh, when you when you say he could be a true ex, like, yeah, people will say Roma Dunze could be a true X, but if you look at his route tree and the success of it and where it's come from, it's from, been from the slot, it's been from the outside, he can move around. I think it also frees up Garrett Wilson to play a little bit more in the slot yeah. where we saw him have a lot of success. So even though he was the number 10 overall pick and people say he's a true X, he does a lot of his damage in the slot as well, and it frees him up to be able to move around in motion and be in the slot. So I think it makes a lot of sense to, to take – Roma Dunze, not as a traditional X, even though he can be that, but just as another good playmaker. You just need playmakers on your offense for your quarterback to have viable receivers to throw the ball to. Yeah. What do you make of the buzz of J.J. McCarthy? Because the reason why I bring him into this right now, a Jets podcast, is no, I don't think the Jets are taking J.J. <laughs> McCarthy, dudes. But I do think there's a very real Ooh. scenario where this dude is going to go – in the top five, six, <laughs> nine. So it was the way I felt when I was packing my bags in Orlando is that we're definitely going to have four quarterbacks taken in the top nine selection. So when you mentioned Rome Dunze, I'm thinking there really is a legit scenario that he is on the board there at 10. Yeah, and some people will say, that could there potentially be five quarterbacks taken in the top 10? Because you know – Teams get itchy when quarterbacks start flying off the board. So we know the Las Vegas Raiders, even though they signed Gardner Minshew, they could be in need of a quarterback of the future yep. for their franchise. The Denver Broncos, the Minnesota Vikings have already done some business to gain another first-round pick. These are all teams that are in the teens. We're not even talking about the first three teams that need quarterbacks. When you look at Chicago, the Commanders, and then the New England Patriots. So right there, there's six viable teams that could be moving up or three teams moving up to potentially – get quarterback so when you look at it and you talk about jj mccarthy i'm not as bullish on him as a lot of people are i just it's just hard for me to take a quarterback in the top five top 10 even in the top 20 who wasn't the focal point of the offense right when you go back to michigan and again is that his fault no uh jim harbaugh knows who he is he knows who what his what his team is and what his team his team wants to be and what he wants to put on on tape they want to be a physical running the football team that plays really good defense he's it's been like that since he was at the university of san diego when he was at stanford it was like that even though they did have andrew luck uh i think he had him for two years and then even when he went to the san francisco uh 49ers that was how his team was based off of it wasn't off the quarterback play it was off the offensive line running the football and playing defense but it's just i'm hard pressed and again the draft is all about potential and projection right and i think Teams can sometimes get in trouble thinking that they can outsmart everybody and projecting what a guy can be instead of actually looking at the team, the tape and seeing what a guy is and seeing what his highest ceiling truly is. Right now, J.J. McCarthy does have some velocity when it comes to tight window throws. He's been really good on third down. But again, he wasn't asked to do much. Like, it's just hard for me to take somebody in the top five when I haven't seen it consistently done on tape. But there's supposedly real buzz. Could this also be smokescreen season? Because now all of a sudden, yeah. the guy I've been really high on is getting a lot of buzz of Michael Penix Jr. And I, and you know me, EA, he's been my quarterback three since the beginning of time. So I, I just yeah. couldn't understand if the medical cleared would just seem like I haven't heard any red flags come out. 
just off the tape alone, he's quarterback three in this draft. Like I didn't, he's the best deep ball thrower in, in football. He has a laser beam as a left arm and a cannon. And I think to me, he processes quicker than every other quarterback in this draft. Now he does need to work on some of those touch passes in the middle of the field. I would say in the 10 to 20 yard range, but nobody throws the ball better down, down the field and nobody processes better. And he proved that he can win. He left Indiana after being injured for multiple years, went to Washington and a program that has been good, but he took them to new heights, EA. He took them to the, the college football championship game when nobody had them probably being in the college football playoff this year. So, like, again, his, he's, ac- he's his accuracy is crazy, it's dude. Out of control. A- and, it's out of control. And, so. and that combination, and I know you love Rome. I mean, that combination was this. The best sick. in college football was, last year. Yeah, I don't even yeah. think it's question. Yeah, and I know Jane Daniels and neighbors, but I, 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 I would have took Penix and uh, Rome. But I, you know, whatever. You can't go wrong with either one. For sure. For sure. <laughs> as far as just a, a lethal combination. Okay, let's get to Joe Douglas's draft history. I would say the diamond, the diamond in the rough out of all of them would be Michael Carter the second out of Duke mm. in the fifth round. Correct. And when you look at it, and this is what we were talking about earlier a little bit, EA, your third, fourth, fifth round picks have to eventually be spot starters or starters. And Michael Carter, MC2 as we call him, but I don't think we have to do that anymore since the other Michael Carter has moved on, um, as literally was a starter from the slot position in day one. Like he earned that spot from day one, one of the best slot corners in the league. And you would think, you know, this is the first year he's eligible to get a deal. It'd be inter- mm. interesting to see you know, what transpires with that, right? Because you got him, DJ, and then with Sauce after next year, they're all going to be up or available for new deals, right? So, like, you talk about having the best secondary and the best corner group in the league. There's some business that has to be done. So, like, <laughs> with Michael Carter, you saw him on Twitter, excited when Kenny Moore got that new deal because he knows that sets the standard <laughs> for the slot corner position, and he knows the next guy usually gets paid more. And the way he's yeah. played... He deserves to get paid. Matt, that was a home run draft pick. Now, how about that 22 class? Does it have the potential to be historic when you're talking about Man. Sauce Gardner at four, Garrett Wilson at 10? You come back and get Jermaine Johnson late in the first round trade up. Then you trade up in the second round. Sneaky, uh, sneaky move there. Yeah. Very clever. Moving up with the Giants. <laughs> get Priest Hall. And so you got those four at the top, but then you're talking about depth pieces down the line, maybe the Michael Clemens of the world. You've talked about Mike uh, Max, Max Mitchell here on this podcast. So, I mean, that draft. Don't for, you forget one very guy. Interesting. Don't forget one guy. Uh, 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 we're going to go to the tight end position. Okay, okay. We're going go, nope, we to go to the tight end position talk about it like Jeremy Ruckett. No, that's my guy, <laughs> man. I think he's a yeah. foundational piece on this team. So you do. I do. Okay, so 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 talk to me about a class like that and what it is right now and its potential and what it says about a GM because I think when we look at Joe Douglas a lot of people are saying putting unrealistic expectations as far as drafting expectations. I'm not saying he's perfect because nobody's perfect no. who drafts. <laughs> not at all. But you name me a GM over the course of five years who has a class like that. Now, a lot of people will come back to me and say, hey, listen, you have to have a bad ball club and lose a lot of games to be in position to be <laughs> where you're at to have a class like that. But bottom line is when you have a class like that, that goes on your resume just as well as any kind of missed us. EA, when the 22 draft class help happened, the first thing I said out of my mouth was that was a franchise defining draft class literally like the first four picks on my draft board I said I think Garrett Wilson was my number two but the rest of the three Brees Hall Jermaine Johnson and Sauce Garner were all number one at their position and you got all four of them like and again with the Garrett Wilson thing it it muddled back and forth um between him I think it was Drake London um, so it was like 1A, 1B, right? It wasn't like I had him as the, the receiver number four or five, right? It was, he, was, he was up there. Um, that was a franchise-defining draft class. Uh, it, it, like, you can say what you want about the Jets, you know, having to struggle to have high draft picks like that. People forget that, that, that Garrett Wilson pick was because Joe Douglas made a great trade 
uh, in trading away Jamal Adams and getting two first That's round right. picks for him. So like whether the Jets were good or not, that was a piece that he traded away to gain an extra pick. And then what people really don't know was not only did they trade back to get Jermaine, they were trying to trade back in the first to get Brees Hall, but they were able to get him in the second and not have to give up as much draft capital. So that was a franchise defining draft class. When you talk about hitting on all four of those first four picks and all four of them being franchise foundational pieces, that is rare. Like, Again, when you talk about first round picks and when they hit, I think it's like a 50% hit rate in regards to them and more right. specifically a quarterback. But for him to hit on all four going into year three, when you talk about offensive rookie of the year, defensive rookie of the year, two time all pro corner, a Pro Bowl defensive end, Brees Hall was snubbed for being a Pro Bowl last year because I think he was second or third in the league in scrimmage yards. Like, it doesn't yeah. get any better than that. Like, that, that is a franchise defining draft class. So, some respect needs to be paid for what he does. And then when you look at draft classes, yeah, you can't just look at the first two years. I think Jeremy Rucker is no. going to be a hell of a player down the road. I still think Max Mitchell has an opportunity to be a really good swing tackle. We see Michael Clemens be able to be a good rotational piece. So, like, he even hit later on in the draft when you look at some of those draft picks. You know, Rucker was banged up, didn't play much his rookie year. But we saw the development in him uh, last year, and now you would think we'd see even more and he'd probably get a lot more playing time now that C.J. Uzama has moved on as well. And then you have to, again, you, you're not absolving anybody for misses here, right. but you do have to take into account the fact that when you do have a change in coaching staffs, there are are different beliefs as far as personnel is concerned and schemes. Correct. So automatically you're going to have guys who might have fit uh, last system or maybe the former coaching staff had one thought on something that are going to change when you bring in a new staff, correct? And ultimately here, the bottom line is I know what people are going to say with Joe is his first round picks over the years, Makai Becton, in 2020, mm -hmm. Zach Wilson, 2021, Elijah Vera Tucker in 21, moved up for him. We talked about 22, and then Will McDonald in 23. My argument, my contention on 21 and Zach Wilson was the Jets were in a situation where I think you had to take a quarterback. The bottom line was you had to take a quarterback and now look at what has happened with that class right now. Now, yeah. I, I know the counter on that Straight is bolt. you don't have to take a quarterback. <laughs> yeah, I, I, know the, I know the counter on that is you don't have to take a quarterback. But it, it would have been laughed out of the league if they didn't take a quarterback exactly. in 21. And, and for all those people that are talking all that crap, they were just <sighs> as high on Zach Wilson as I was. I was very high on Zach Wilson. And, and there's a couple things that go with that, right? It's – Sometimes the development isn't there. Sometimes uh, you just things that you saw on tape in college don't develop the right way at the next level. And sometimes, sometimes a young man just has to mature too. Like there's a lot that goes into it when you go talk about a pick in a top five, especially at the quarterback position. And you stated it perfect, EA. Just look at the rest of the class. There's still question marks about the guy that went before Zach Wilson. So like you just never yes. know. Like like Justin Fields is no longer with the Bears, right? If you look at um, Mac Jones, he's no longer with the uh, New England Patriots. Like, And Trey Lance is no longer with the San Francisco 49ers. These were guys that were picked right after Zach Wilson. So you just truly never know. <clears throat> and people were saying that 21 class could potentially be the best quarterback class that we had seen in a decade, right? So uh, I think people it's so interesting. Yeah, underestimated that 20 class and how good it really is. Now, that is really – one of the best quarterback classes that we've seen in the last decade. When you look at yeah. Herbert, Joe Burrow, uh, Hertz, right, Tua Tunga Valoa, like that was a ridiculous class. And people going into that draft weren't talking about that class being that special and they end up being one of the most special quarterback classes. So you just, you really just truly never know, EA. All right. So lastly, on um, some of Douglas's and the Jets' recent drafting. You have high expectations for Joe Tipman. We saw yeah. him uh, be taken in the second round last year. We talked about Carter Warner already here. 
Izzy Abanacana right now in the depth chart. He's second behind Brees Hall. He got some valuable playing time down the yeah, stretch. Yeah, can, can we stop it right year. there? Because that's another yeah, thing. Yeah, people, yeah. People are killing me with the we can't go into the season with Izzy <laughs> as the backup. I'm like, what? What have you actually seen on tape that says we can't? Like when he got carries late in the year, he was still averaging over four yards a carry. So I'm like, what? Like people are like we got to bring in a vet, and I'm not saying we don't need to bring in a vet. But again, it's all about developing your your, your young talent. You would yes. think going into his second year, more comfortable in the offense, he would take a step. Because I know the biggest thing for him was protection, and that that usually hurts a lot of young running backs. EA in regards to not getting on the field is knowing your protections, knowing when the quarterback checks who you're supposed to block, and then being able to physically block people in the protection. So another year with the strength program, another year being comfortable in the offense, you would think he would take a step. I just thought it was hilarious that people were like, we just we just can't go into the year where it, in preseason, everybody was on the Israel Abandaconda hype train. Now all of a sudden the kid uh, can't no. play. Like it's, it's crazy no, to I, me. I, <laughs> that's that's a that's a fair take. And a couple guys that I'm gonna watch this summer, pay close attention to. I know the stars are obviously gonna get most of the light, which they should, but the guys like Jarek Bernard Converse, yep. a six round pick uh, out of LSU, uh, a guy who's got some interesting athletic traits. And then you could say the same thing about Zach Kuntz yeah. at the tight end position. Um, and just down the line here under Douglas's draft record, Jamie and Sherwood is a valuable piece on this roster. They got him in the fifth round in 2021. Dues. Yeah, right? Yep. Brandon Eccles. He's going to be counted on even more now with Bryce Hall going to Tampa and Justin Hardy from a special teams perspective yeah. signing with the Cleveland Browns. So Eccles is a big piece on this roster, right. a special, uh, especially on special teams. He's going to provide depth um, there at the cornerback position where the Jets are loaded right now. So um, have we learned anything uh, about Joe from his past drafts that gives us insight on what's going to happen ahead. I mean, one thing for sure, and we've talked about this before EA is that he loves that trench work. He loves to draft guys in the trenches. So um, when you look at pick number 10 and that, and that's been the conversation, right? Do you take another offensive tackle that potentially is going to be a development guy in a all in type year, which again, you still need, guys for the longevity of this franchise to develop really well. And then we also know the history of Tyron Smith, right? And, and how he hasn't been able to complete a whole season, I think in the last four or five seasons. So um, taking a guy in the top 10, again, it doesn't necessarily mean that guy's going to be a home run pick right away, right? There's a development that needs to happen. Even if you do take an offensive tackle where I, I feel like taking a receiver is more of a sure bet. And I think, Joe Douglas showed you two years ago, he's not afraid to take a receiver in the top 10 because he took Garrett Wilson and that was a home run pick, right? So when you look at Joe D, he literally always wants to solidify the offensive line and defensive line. It's going to be a little trickier this year just because of the lack of picks the Jets actually have. Now, does that mean they potentially trade back? Because he's answered so many questions via free agency in regards to filling holes on this roster, it does give them the option to potentially trade back and get more draft capital with that first pick at number 10. So that is an option as well. But just knowing Joe Douglas, he likes to make sure that he has more than enough in regards to having depth in the O-line and D-line, right? Those are two areas he likes to really lock in. He's actually done a really good job in free agency. So this is going to be, to me, a wild card draft for Joe, right? Could, and, okay. uh, could this be where he trades back? Could it be where he takes receiver? People have talked about Brock Bowers. I think positional value, that's a little high at number 10 overall, even though he is a really good player and an explosive player with the football in his hand. Me and you have talked about EA. I love our tight end group. I think it's a really good group. I think it's a deep group, right? I think it goes four deep. I think you talked about Zach Koontz as a guy that you want to watch. I think uh, Kenny Yabo is another guy you want to watch this summer. I think okay. he's developed really well, and you know he was banged up for most of the year, and I think he came back and gave some good reps towards the end of the back season last year. So um, this is this could be a wild card, right? He could go receiver, honestly, or he could trade back and gain more draft capital that way. He can get a receiver and a offensive tackle in the first and second round if if they're able to trade back and it makes sense. 
Man, I like that. That's going to be our theme moving forward. The wild card draft. The wild for card Joe draft Douglas. for Joe Douglas. You kind of knew where he was going. I don't think people in 22 expected Sauce Gardner to go that high, but it was a home run hit, right? And we knew that they needed a receiver and they were going to take one pretty high and they took one at 10. I would have, would have, you know, me, I wouldn't have been mad if they took Jermaine at four at the time, but they ended mm-hmm. up getting them later. So, like, he answered every need the Jets had in 22. Now he's in a scenario where the roster, you know, on paper, and again, the game is played on the field, but on paper, a lot of holes have been filled. That's why I say it's kind of a wild card draft because there's so many ways he can go at that number 10 pick. We debated this, dudes, inside this very studio this week. Can't you make the argument right now, to your point, number one, I'm going to preface this statement, this question, by saying it's April. Yeah. It's April 3rd. Games aren't played on paper. Facts. But <laughs> top, top, top to bottom, can't you make the argument right now that the Jets have the most talented roster in the AFC East? Yeah, if you're talking about on paper right now, and then you would also yeah. have to preface that by saying with everybody being healthy, right? Because that's a yes. big thing as well. Uh, I would say I don't even think it's a question right now in regards to the top to bottom full roster. Cause you saw Buffalo bills have a mass ex- exodus on their roster this all season. Now a lot of those players were getting older and their cap hits were extremely high, but when you just look at the, at the teams, I think Miami is probably a close second. The only thing is I would say, which, you know, going into the season, I don't think a lot of people would say the O line is a bigger issue right now in Miami than it is for the jets. Um, just because Taron Armstead and, Tyron Smith, I would say maybe cancel each other out because there's a question mark. Could those guys actually make it through a whole season healthy? But uh, Austin Jackson and Morgan Moses, I would give the slight edge to Morgan, right? And then AVT, if healthy, they lost Robert Hunt. I think he's better than anybody they got in the inside. AVT went healthy, right? And then Tipman as well. Uh, they did sign Aaron Brewer, but I think Tipman, I would give the, the edge for development and also projection to Joe Tittman a little bit more too. So when you look at it and even, and even Buffalo who lost, like I said, lost a lot of pieces. I think the slight edge has to go to the jets. If everybody is healthy again, I will preface that by saying if everybody is actually healthy. (laughs) Totally fair point. So let's end here. What do you make of the landscape for Joe Douglas and the jets and Robert Sala in terms of windows, you are a guy who is an analyst, but also played between those white lines. What do you make of the jets being in a win now mode and how that impacts the draft? Yeah. So EA for people that don't know, like, and players usually get a sense of it pretty early. Like when you're in a window where your team's really good and you know, it's only going to last three years, max, maybe four, if you're lucky, depending on your quarterback, right? And we've heard Joe Burrow said, you know, as long as I'm here, we're always, our window's always open, right? So, like, we got guys like Mahomes, like, people will throw Josh Allen in that, but I honestly think the Buffalo Bills have missed their window in in regards to, that's why you saw that mass exodus of some of those veteran players. When you looked at their roster, I would say going back the last four years, They were in that window like the last four years, and I think they've surpassed that window now. Um, San Fran, they're technically probably have like two more years just because you're going to – once you eventually play the quarterback, it's hard to stay in that window, right? They're going to have to pay Brock Purdy soon. Right now they can get away with paying all those pro bowlers because they don't have to pay a quarterback. So when you look at the Jets, right, with Aaron Rodgers' age, and then you look at Tyron Smith and Morgan Moses and their age, right, you would think like the Jets have a two-year window max right now to to make a Mm. significant run to the Super Bowl now. That's why I always say development is so key, right? And and one of my mock drafts, I took a quarterback in the fourth. I took Michael Pratt because I thought it was smart to be behind a guy like Tyrod and Aaron Rodgers for two years, learn and potentially turn into a starter, right? And and if you don't like his development, it's a fourth-round pick. You can still take a quarterback two years later. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I think you have to keep throwing darts at quarterbacks just because – you never know when you're going to get a Brock Purdy. You never know when you're going to get a Tom Brady, right? You just never know when you get a late round draft pick or Dak Prescott is going to happen and they develop well and become a, a future starter for you. That's why you keep throwing darts out there. And that's why I'm so, I harp on like your development is so key, right? Your third, fourth, fifth rounders. I'll say it one more time, EA. Your third, fourth, and fifth round draft picks 
have to eventually be spot starters or turn into starters eventually, right? That's how you have longevity and consistency in this league. So uh, when you look at this landscape of this quote unquote two year run that the Jets are technically in to try to win a championship game. Yes, you want to go all in. You want to bring some of those veteran pieces to help you get over the top. But you can't forget about the longevity and having consistency in this league. And that's why the draft is monumental. I said this earlier uh, this year at EA that the the draft literally dictates how the NFL moves in free agency and everything else. Right. Because we saw an influx of running backs getting paid when people thought that that position wasn't getting paid anymore. And it's because this isn't a strong draft class at the running back position. So that's why Saquon got upwards of $13 million. That's why Josh Jacobs got upwards to $12 million. That's why DeAndre Swift got $8 million. That's why Tony Pollard got $8 million. Where before, running backs weren't getting paid close to that, right? That's why I say the NFL draft dictates what happens in free agency. Adversely, this is a strong running uh, receiver group, right? And offensive tackle group. What happened in free agency? Only like two receivers actually got crazy bags. No offensive tackles really got paid because the NFL draft dictates what teams do because teams understand, yes, you can bring in free agency, but you build through the draft. That's how you have consistency. Well, I'll tell you what, Joe Douglas has navigated this offseason to date. Yeah. Almost perfect. Almost perfect. I, I, <laughs> and remember, EA, people I, I, were coming for his head in the beginning. I know, I know. So that's that 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 sets us up for an exciting weekend in Detroit, and we're going to continue to prepare for that here on the Draft Podcast. That's Lejay Doosable looking looking good down there with his Jets polo in Florida. Yeah, we're, we're hoping we can bring the polos back here. Got to bring them back, man. Uh, up, uh, up north soon, man. Hey, Deuce, enjoyed it, buddy. Appreciate you, EA.